may be seated. Thank you. I did see him. Brother Chris Weaver. Would you please stand and lead us in prayer, brother? like today, um, it's always you kind of get in mind the way you want to do things, and then you get in here and you realize you've lost your mind and you've forgotten the way you were going to do things. So uh, I think first of all, I'd just like to have every mother stand. Every mother please stand. I'll remain standing for just a few minutes. Well, just a moment or two, really. First of all, I have this observation to make. It's a whole lot better looking crowd standing than would be if the daddies were standing today. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Fellas, um, I appreciate every one of you and I say this sincerely. I'm not just trying to be full of sap because it's Mother's Day. I say this sincerely, but the hope of this world, if there's any hope, if there's any hope, it is in godly mothers. That amen wasn't loud enough. We need a good amen on that. Now, I know the love of God is what makes the difference. But most of the time, as I've already said, the love of God is usually expressed through us and to us by the love of a godly mother. And, you know, I'm, it's just so, uh, so good to look and, and see all of you here today. And I can't help but just take advantage of my position for just a minute. And just say that there's there's two ladies that are standing right back here uh, beside Carol that are special to us. Uh, the one in green is Carol's mother. Most most of you know that. Um, and the one in, I'm going to call it red. I don't know what it is, but that's my mom. And uh, y'all are... Y'all are permitted to speak to them and love on them, but ask no questions about the children. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I told my mama this morning, I said, Happy Mother's Day, Mom. You need to realize that it is good children that make good mothers. <laughs> Amen. But anyway, ladies, I appreciate you so very much. And uh, those of us who are seated now, those that are not standing, but... Let's give them as good a round of applause as we can muster, all right? Thank you very much. You may be seated. Now, I'm, I'm just curious today. You know, usually we go through... Um, I do alternate years myself, but uh, I'm just curious today as to... Uh, the oldest mother here. I, I think I might know, but then again, I might not. So, uh, uh, I'm not going to have you stand back up since you've been standing for a while, but uh, all you mamas who's over 75, if you're over 75, raise your hand. If you're over 75. Now, as I go up, you can put them down because there ain't nobody watching you. There ain't nobody paying attention to you. So hold them up as I, you know, put them down as I go up. 76, 77, 78, 79, 80. Here we are at 80 and there's still a bunch of hands raised. 81, 82, 83, 84. 85, 
86, 87, 88. What about a little bit here at 89? But 88. Did both of you put your hand down? Am I going to have to go back and count months? Both of you, Miss Pat and Eva? Oh, you're 86. Okay, so you're 88. All by yourself, Miss Pat. Amen. Lord bless you. Now, in this crowd, the youngest mother, I, you know, if uh, I depended on Sierra to be here, that one would be easy. But boy, the youngest mom, wow. Uh, and I'd get in trouble just starting. Trying to get an age to start, right? So, uh, I tell you what I'll do. If you're 74 and down, that way I won't make anybody aggravated. I started at 75, so if you're 74 and down, raise your hand. 74 and down. All right, 73, 72, 71, 70, 69, 68, 67, 65, 64, 63, 62, 61, 60. Um, oh, I, oh, I see now. Okay, 60. <laughs> Uh, 50, I just jumped, uh, 40, 39, 38, 37, 36, 35, 34, whoa, put them back up, 35, 34, so both of y'all are 35. Both of y'all 34. Birthday? Lauren just turned 35. You're not you're not 35 yet. You just turned 34. Well you be the youngest one here then, alright? Alrighty then. Well I could I could do this all day, but I you know, I've exhausted my counting ability. But anyway, mamas, all you mamas, uh, may the Lord uh, bless you, uh, tremendously bless you today. You might have noticed some flowers out there in the front of the church. Um, and you, and I'm just going to tell you, you can tell that I don't get out much. But when I saw those flowers, that's the first time I've ever seen them. I've never seen those kind of flowers before, and I was kind of in charge of getting them, so, so y'all got alien flowers today, all right? I don't know what they are. Some of the ladies yesterday saw them, and when I unloaded them and stacked them out there, and some, um, what was it you called them? A horse something? Oh, a rooster what? Rooster comb. Well, I... I guess you might be able to see a, a, a rooster comb if you look hard enough. But, uh, okay. Okay, we got a few red ones, but then we got some different colors too. Um, but they kind of reminded me of the pods on the Night of the Living Dead. That's the <laughs> But anyway, all you mamas here today, and I think we've got enough just for, for the ladies here today. Um, after service, some guys will be back there to assist to get those flowers out of the floor and make sure that all mamas, everybody, gets a flower today. And um, there's a few that we want uh, to deliver, so we're going to, to set back a few to deliver to some of our others who's not here, maybe we can send some uh, by some of the daughters who are here. Uh, but anyway, it's just, a, it's just a little token of appreciation. Ladies, we can't, we can't possibly give you what you're worth, but we thank the Lord for you. Okay? Um, now, 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. And I would wonder if there's anyone now with any special spoken prayer request that you'd like to mention. Anywhere in the house. Miss Suzanne. I went to a memorial service yesterday for a young man that killed himself. And I can't get his mother off my mind today. And so just pray for the Gilmore family. Yes. Miss Christine. Anybody else? Ms. Barbara. Which, by the way, I, I don't know if I mentioned it last week or not, but um, Mr. Bill and Ms. Barbara had a wedding anniversary this year. Or this year. Of course they did. This week. It was on May the 10th. So let's give them a good hand, all right? Yes, absolutely. Miss Martha. Okay. Carol. What you need to pray for is me, but uh, with both of them. Amen. Uh, Michelle? Remember Megan Young? She's in the hospital. She's really having a hard time. So just okay. remember her. She's a young mother, and especially today, she's, she's having a difficult day. All right. Yes, sir. Miss Bates. Chris Austin called this morning. He said, Back to church. We're praying for Ryan Burke's sister in Missouri. Continue to pray that God will win it yesterday. Well, amen. 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 Thank God. That's enough to unwither the corn for a day or two. Amen. Um, Miss Linda? Right. Yes, ma'am. Let's bow our heads for prayer, please. Fathers, we come to you this day. This is the day that you've made. And Lord, we're rejoicing and we're glad in it. Lord, this is a day that we've set aside especially to honor our mothers. And Lord, I'm grateful to be able to do that right here in the church. And Lord, mothers are special no matter where they are, no matter where they're from or what the situations and circumstances. But Lord, there's something about a Christian mother that just makes her that much more special. And I want to thank you, Lord, for every one of these ladies who are here today. And I pray, God, your finest blessings be upon them. And I 
ask you, Lord, that this day would truly uh, be special to them, Lord, and they'd be blessed this day. I'm grateful, Lord, that they're here in church this morning, perhaps with their family around them. And dear Lord, maybe this afternoon they'll be spending some more time with family and friends. And Father, I pray that it would just be a wonderful day for them. Lord, once again, there have been so many prayer requests. There seem to be so many people suffering. Uh, there's so many different situations and circumstances. Lord, we, we're not able to keep up with everything, but we know that you are. And Lord, we don't know exactly how to pray, but we know that you know what is necessary and you know what is needful. And we pray, Lord, that as you're working your will and your way in folks' lives, that you'd manifest your presence. Lord, please be with us in the continuation of this service. I ask God that everything that we do and say, Lord, would lift up the name of the Lord Jesus and that it would be uplifting and edifying and building, Lord, to every person who's here today. And when we leave here after a while, Lord, that we'll all be able to say it was good to have been in the house of the Lord today. And we'll thank you, Lord, and we'll praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'm going to ask that, and I'm going to give you just a little extra time this morning to fellowship because there might be some mamas around here that are special to you, and you might want to hug a few necks. And, uh, you know, we've not been able to do a whole lot of neck hugging in the past few years, but... Uh, Let's just play like COVID never existed today, all right? Just go ahead and hug a few necks and tell some people how much you love them. So we're going to make a little music for you. Y'all just have a time of fellowship.
I feel better, but I still ain't at the par. But I, I, I feel. And I do want to take this opportunity before the offering this morning to say to you how, how faithful you are to give. The Lord bless you and just bless you and bless you for, for that that you've given to the Lord. He notices everything that we do for Him and He multiplies it and He makes sure that He opens up the windows of heaven and He pours out a blessing on us that we can't receive. So I do appreciate your giving today. We bow our heads once again, please. Brother Bill, would you ask God's blessing on the offering, sir? service to begin. I saw a fellow walking up the outside aisle with a guitar and I thought well good we got somebody going to sing a song today. So I kind of slipped around the, the back there. I think he was back there uh, playing that old Chinese song Tuning. You know what that is? Uh, but anyway uh, when I went back there I asked him I said brother you going to sing a song for us today? And uh, he said, well, I can. I said, well, good. I said, by the way, I'm Rex Ware. And he stuck his head out and he said, well, I'm Richard Benton. And I thought, man, you know, we have, that's a name. Brother Richard, I just want you to know that there's hardly a service goes by that that precious lady right there calls your name out in prayer. She's so faithful to do that. So uh, Brother Richard's going to sing for us today. So he'll, he'll come and bless our hearts.
boy was good to be here this morning. Got to see a lot of faces I hadn't seen in a long time. Amen. I appreciate all y'all's prayer. Y'all continue to pray for me. To be well known of men, I may not ever be. I'm sure my name will not go down in history. There'll be no marble plaques to tell of my good deeds, nor any great. One 
drop water, but still no water fell. He always was a selfish man, his heart was filled with greed. Now a little drop of water is all he'll ever be. There's one way to heaven, it's by amazing grace. Where everyone is equal, no matter creed or race. So have no other Bible, and always put God first. We'll live on in the honey, and we will never thirst. Give me one drop of water, the rich people, <clears throat> one drop of water, but still no water fell. He always was a selfish man, his heart was filled with greed. Now a little drop of water is all he'll ever need. Yeah, a little drop of water is all he'll ever need. Turn with me, please, to the book of Genesis, the very first book in the Bible. Chapter 2. I'm actually going to read as a text verse a verse from chapter number 3. So you're there real close. Just look at chapter 3. And there's one verse that I'd like to read to begin with. And that would be verse number 20. Verse 20 of chapter 3. The Bible says, Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. She was the mother of all living. I'd like to speak to you this morning for just a few moments. If I was to put a title on the message, it would be from this particular verse, and I would simply call it Eve, the mother of us all. Eve, the mother of us all. Now, let me qualify before I get started this morning. Let me make some things Known to those of you who may not know me as well as most of you do. But I want you to know that I am a Bible believer. I believe the Bible is the Word of God. I believe that it's inspired. It's God-breathed. It's theonistos, according to the Greek word. It's breathed out from God. And the Scriptures are authoritative. And I believe them from Genesis to maps. Amen? Amen? I believe the Bible. And I preach the Bible. I believe the Bible is the truth of God. And if you reject the Bible, then I know you're going to reject me. And if you reject the Bible, you're going to reject what I say. But you know what? That does not change the Bible. You can bang on an anvil with all kinds of hammers. And the hammers will wear out. And the anvil will remain. And the word of God has been attacked. It has been pounded on down through the ages of time. 
Guess what? The word of God remains and the hammers are broke. Amen. Now, the things that I'll say this morning, I'm going to say them that's based right here in this word of God. Now, look in Genesis chapter number two. I want to tell you several things about this woman Eve that I believe we need to understand. First of all, I want you to look at verse 18 of chapter 2. We're going to see, first of all, her creation. The creation of the woman. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make an help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Adam gave names to all cattle, to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. One of the things that I've always thought of when I thought about the creation of the woman, it was the last thing that God ever created. Have y'all ever considered that? <laughs> we'll consider it now. The last thing that God ever created. And I think personally because there's nothing greater that God could have ever created. When he created the woman, that was the crown of creation. There was nothing else that could be any better. I love what Matthew Henry, the old Bible commentary from uh, hundreds of years ago said. He said, and I quote, The woman was taken from Adam's side, not from his head to rule over him, not from his feet to be trampled on, but from his side to be equal with him, from under his arm to be protected, from close to his heart to be loved. Amen. Mr. Henry, well said. The creation of the woman. The Lord took a little piece of dirt. And with that dirt he made a man. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. You'll find that in the first part of chapter number 2. But when it came to the creation of the woman. Wait a minute. This is some delicate surgery going on here. And he actually went inside the man. And took a part from the man. And from that man. He made a woman. And he closed up the flesh thereof. God was the first surgeon. And he didn't even need a scalpel. Amen? Amen. The woman was created. The crown of creation. Let me call a second thing to your mind. The obligation of the help me. Now here... Here is where a lot of you gals are liable to get sideways. And, you know, down through all of these years, I've been called everything in the world. I've been called, a, what is it, a male chauvinist, egotistical pig. I've been called that. But I want you to understand that I'm not giving you wearology today. I'm giving you what the Bible says. And I refer uh, my, give you a reference to what I said at the beginning of the service. 
Let me say just a word about the obligation of the help me that God made for Adam. Now, I'm going to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. And I want to read these verses to you, beginning with verse uh, number 7. It says this, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. Did you hear that, fellas? We, the man, is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. It's so quiet, I hear a bug walking across the carpet. Let me read on. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Now it's so quiet in here. Y'all are wondering, what's he going to say now? I'm simply going to tell you that I believe what the Bible says, ladies and gentlemen. Somewhere down the line, now listen, I don't, I could get off on this and stay till one o'clock and I could never get everything said, what needs to be said. So I'm not going to try to. But I'm telling you that the woman was under obligation by God to be a helpmeet for the man. She's the glory of the man. She was of the man. She was created for the man. I don't know exactly when it happened or where it happened. That, and we, we call it women's lib. I do Dr. Dr. Adrian Rogers had a sermon that he preached along these lines. It had three points, as I recall. Adam's rib, Satan's fib, women's lib. <laughs> but somewhere down the line, women got to thinking that they were being trampled on, they had no rights, they were treated like cattle, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not saying, ladies, that that might be so. And, and that might be so, and there's nothing right about that. But I will tell you this. When a woman begins to declare that she is totally independent from the man, she is leaving the obligation that God made her to fulfill. Now you can like it or you can lump it. But that's what the scripture says. Amen. And we got so many women running around today trying to find themselves. But they hate men. They hate kids. They hate the home. They hate everything it stands for. You'll never find yourself until you surrender to what God says. Now, you might be sitting there saying, <laughs> Well, I ask you, please, don't take it up with me. Take it up with your Creator. Take it up with your Creator. It is God who created the woman to be the helpmeet for the man. And y'all have heard me say this before. But, you know, and I'm hearing lots of, matter of fact, I've heard a lot about it just lately. There's some of this psycho babble that we hear today. It's, it's everywhere. And, uh, and everywhere, you know, this, this person was waxing eloquent about how men need to get in touch with their feminine side. Well, can I tell you something? Do y'all see that lady sitting right back there with the pink sweat on next to the back there? That's my feminine side. <laughs> Hello? God created the woman to complete the man. To make him whole. Because it is not good for the man to be alone either. So there was an obligation that was involved in the very beginning. Each one had a role to play. 
The man had his part. And I'm not preaching to men today. And the women had her part. Eve had her part. And it's her that we're looking at today. There was an obligation that was involved. There was a job that she was to do. There was a role that she was to fulfill. And now let's move on to a third point. Her conversation with the serpent. Verse number one of chapter three. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, first of all, there's something remarkable about a serpent talking. Would you agree with that? Who knows? Maybe all of the animals talked in the beginning. I, I don't know. You might could make an argument for it or against it. I, you know, if you want to argue for it, I'm not going to argue with you. If you want to argue against it, I'm not going to disagree with you. I don't know. Only thing I know is this serpent talked. He had a conversation with her. And the woman said unto the serpent, and it didn't seem to flabbergast her any that this serpent was talking. I mean, she just, just you know, started talking to him. Of course, that's no big deal. Women have been talking to snakes from the very beginning. Amen? Amen. Most of them walking up on two legs. Amen. I heard that amen. <laughs> we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, wait a minute, Eve. God hadn't said a word about touching it. So this serpent comes along and first thing he do, he wants to cast a little doubt on the word of God. Yea, hath God said, did God say this? Did God really say this? That there's some trees you can't eat from? And Eve comes back and she says, yeah, said, there's, there's one tree that we're not even supposed to touch. God didn't say anything about touching. So she's adding to the word of God, which... You're always going to get in trouble if you start adding to the Word of God, y'all. You take God for what He says. You don't add to it. You don't think about it. And you know that, and that's a lot of trouble that we have sometimes. We say, well, this is what I think the Lord meant. And we get in trouble by what we think it means. Now, I'm in a position week after week after week after week after week of trying to stand up here and try by the grace of God, by the Spirit of God, to let you know what the Spirit of the Lord says. And most of the time, <coughs> excuse me, most of the time I'm fairly confident that I can do that. But every once in a while I have to let you know, now, let me give you a little wearology. When I say that, y'all know what that means. I'm fixing to give you my opinion. I'm fixing to tell you what I think. And by the way, my opinion is most important to me. Did y'all catch that? Amen. Your opinion is most important to you. And your opinion is as good as my opinion. But when God says this, and there's no opinion to it, then we better take what the Lord says. Amen? Amen? The serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. He flat out denies what God said. He flat out said, no, God, you are not going to die. God's lying to you. God's telling you a falsehood. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So she has a conversation with this serpent, whom we're going to find out in just a few minutes, was the devil incarnate. He was in that serpent. The book of Revelation identifies him, calls him Satan. That old serpent, Revelation says. I want you to notice her lack of discrimination. She begins to talk to this serpent. This serpent is casting doubts 
toward the word of God. She keeps talking to him. He denies the word of God. She keeps talking to him. She keeps talking to him. She lacks discrimination. She should have told him, now wait a minute. You just get on from here. God wouldn't lie to us. And you get gone. I don't know who you are, talking serpent. Just get on from here. But that's not what she did. She didn't use the discrimination. Ladies and gentlemen, for that matter, do not listen to those doubtful voices. Do not give them a place. Are you listening? Some people get upset with what they read on Facebook. Well, bless God, quit reading it. Amen. 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 Some people get tore up with websites that are out there. Well, just do away with them. Leave them alone and let them die to death. Don't soak your soul with that stuff. Get away from it. Use some discrimination. If it's not helpful, then it's harmful. Let it go. But she didn't use any discrimination. Now I want you to notice the satanic temptation. Look at verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. There's a few questions in my mind that I don't have time to explore right now. But number one, I'd like to know where is Adam in the beginning of the chapter? Hello? <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. Where is Adam in the beginning of the chapter? It appears to me that Eve is off somewhere without him. She's off down there by that tree. She shouldn't have been down there. Adam should have been making sure she wasn't down there. I don't know where he was. Hello? Of course, women have been asking that question forever, right? I don't know where he is. I have no idea where he is. I don't either. I don't know where he was. But he wasn't with her. Should have been, but he wasn't. Adam could have took care of that serpent. Adam could have put him to going in a heartbeat. He could have got his wife by the arm and said, we need to get out of this place. We need to get away from this tree right now. Come on, let's go. But Adam was nowhere to be found. And there's his wife facing the devil all by herself. Just take a look around today. Now I know that there are some widow ladies who are sitting here today whose husbands have gone on to be with the Lord. But there are a lot of ladies who are sitting here today who have husbands who are sitting at the house or they're on the golf course or they're fishing or they're somewhere else. And I'd just like to know where they are. They ought to be here with their wife. They ought to be taking the lead of the spiritual matters of their home. Adam wasn't present. He wasn't there. He couldn't protect her. He couldn't deal with this serpent because he wasn't there. And now, I want you to understand 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. You don't need to go there. I'm just going to quote it. It talks about the everything that is in the world, and this is what it says. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. It's not of the Father, but it's of the world. Now, did you get that? The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Now look at verse 6. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food. The lust of the flesh, good for food. 
and that it was pleasant to the eyes. The lust of the eyes. And that it was a tree to be desired to make one wise. The pride of life. The devil used those three avenues of temptation with Eve. He was successful and so successful has he been with these three avenues of temptation that he's never changed them. They're the same now as they have been since the Garden of Eden. We're tempted by the things that we want, the things we desire. We're tempted by the things we see, and we're tempted because of the pride of our life. We want to be somebody. And that's the same way the woman was tempted. But now I want you to notice her motivation. She said, it was all of this was to be desired to make one wise. The devil had said, the Lord is keeping you away from this tree because he don't want you to be like he is. Her motivation was, well, I want to be like God is. So she could justify herself. And you say, boy, that's ridiculous. Yes, it is. But have you ever noticed how ridiculous we are sometimes? We do stuff and somehow or another we'll twist it and twist it. We'll find us in scripture and we want to try to justify what we do by what the Bible says. Sometimes I'll go to quoting the Bible to Carol and she'll bear them eyes and she'll say, Don't you quote scripture to me right now. Because <laughs> she thinks I'm trying to twist it around and get it on my side which I usually am. But anyway, her motivation was that she be like God. It's not that she had a desire to sin. It's not that she wanted to, to rebel against God. It's not that she wanted to get kicked out of the garden. It's not that she wanted to die. It's not that she wanted to bring sin into the world. She wanted to better herself. She wanted a better way of life. Are you hearing me? And then look at verse 7. She gave to her husband. Excuse me, I'm, I'm still. Verse 6. She took the fruit. She did eat. Then she gave unto her husband with her. And he did eat. I don't know if she took a big bite of that fruit, whatever it was. And then she found Adam. I don't know. Adam was missing in the first part of the chapter, but now Adam's right here. And I wrote this down. An increasing deprivation. What do you mean? Once she took of the fruit herself... She now becomes a seductress so she can get Adam to eat also. You see, ladies and gentlemen, sin is a mighty slippery slope. Once you start down that slope, you can't get stopped. You think you can throw the brakes on anytime you want to, but what you're going to find is once you start sliding, you're going to slide all the way to the bottom. That's the nature of the way sin is. Now verse 7 and 8. The eyes of them both were opened. They knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together. And made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God. Walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves. From the presence of the Lord God. Among the trees of the garden. Does that sound like liberated souls to you? Does that sound like being like God? They sewed fig leaves together and made an apron. Now can you just imagine what that thing looked like? A fig leaf apron. By the way, if there's anybody here planning on getting to heaven with your righteousness, 
If there's anybody here thinking that you can be good enough, that you can you can do good stuff, you can do righteous stuff, uh, you can you can make your own way to heaven. May I tell you that the Bible just described what your righteousness is. It's an apron of fig leaves. Are you hearing me? Now y'all know what an apron is? You know it don't cover a whole lot, does it? Come on now. Y'all go ahead and smile. You can laugh. It's in the Bible. Let's have a little fun with this. An apron. You don't want to turn around when you got an apron on. Amen? So when God comes walking and says, Hey, y'all, where are you? They realize, you know what, this, this apron, it, it ain't going to do. Let's hit the bushes. Let's get away from God. And that's exactly what you're going to discover one day if you try to stand before God with your fig leaf apron on. You better have more than your own righteousness. You better have more than your own goodness. Amen. There's contamination. Sin has come into the world. The eyes, they're, they're, they're open. They, they realize they've done what God said not. They've opened the floodgate. Pandora's box has been opened. Sin has entered into the universe. The devil has been triumphant. The serpent has been successful. Now Adam and Eve are no longer these perfect creatures. These wonderful creatures that God has made. Now comes examination by God. Look at verse 9. The Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? Now God is fixing to examine them. He has arraigned them in front of him. But I want to show you all something. You already know this, but let me just point it out to you. Just listen very carefully. And the man said, The woman... The woman whom thou gavest me. Do you understand that Adam has the gall to blame God? You done it. You gave me this woman. It's her fault, but ultimately it's your fault because you made her and gave her to me. Accusation. Amen? Shift the blame. And the Lord God said to the woman, okay, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent. Boy, it didn't take her long to learn from old Adam, did it? Adam done throwed her under the bus. Adam done blamed her, blamed God. And now the woman, she catches on real quick. She said, the serpent, the serpent. Or in the words of Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it. The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Now the Lord God didn't ask the serpent what he was thinking because there's nobody the serpent could blame. There he is, just standing there with him. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, you're cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Which, 
This is a good spot for me to put in my little commercial. Some of you are laughing. You know what's coming. I was ranting and raving about how much I hate snakes here a while back. And somebody looked at me and said, Now, preacher, now, preacher, do you mean you hate creatures that God made? And I said, you need to understand that God didn't make a snake. He looked at me like I'd slapped him. What do you mean God didn't make a snake? God made everything. I said, God didn't make a snake. God made a serpent. I don't know what a serpent was. But God didn't make a snake. But God cursed the serpent. And the serpent became a snake. And may I remind you, of all the critters that are upon this planet, a snake is the only critter with the curse of God on him. That's the reason I shout hallelujah every time I see one dead in the road. <laughs> By the way, don't start talking to me about black snakes and blue snakes and purple snakes. All I'm interested in are dead snakes. The serpent got cursed, turned into a snake. And then he says in verse 15, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. I'll come back to that in a minute. Under the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. It was because of the fall in the Garden of Eden that caused the tension and the contentions between men and women. The man will rule over you, but you ain't ever going to like it. It's all right, ladies. Go ahead and say amen. He's going to rule over you, but you ain't going to like it. And it's going to be a bone of contention from now on. Condemnation. God cursed them. And we all know this story. But let me close on this note right here. Look back at verse 15 for just a moment. When God cursed the serpent, he told him this. He said, I'm going to put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Understand that women don't have seed. Men have seed. All in the scripture, it's always about the seed of the man. It's not about the seed of the woman. This is the only scripture in the entire Bible that has anything to say about the seed of the woman. Now, why is that? Because God is saying that there's going to come a time when there is going to be a woman and she's going to have seed. And the reason she's going to have seed is because I'm going to put the seed in her. And some 4,000 years after this incident in the Garden of Eden, to a young virgin girl named Mary, an angel was sent one day and told her that she was about to become pregnant. She was going to have a baby. And the only thing that Mary said was, Now, how? How? I'm, I'm engaged to Joseph, but we haven't come together. And, and, and how, how can I have a baby? And the angel said, The power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of God shall overshadow you. And that holy child that shall be born of you shall be called the Son of of God. Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, is the seed of the woman. Jesus is the one who came and He is the one who bruised the head of the Satan. And He bruised Him on the cross of Calvary. 
Amen? Amen. He bruised him. He died for the sins of the world. He shed his blood so that sinners might be saved. Eve is then called the mother of all living because she was saved and the entire human race was saved because of childbearing. And when the time came for God himself to come into this world through birth, he come through the womb of a woman and became a man. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Boy, there's a lot here, isn't there? May I ask? All of you have just been reminded of this Bible story. You've known it for years. The story of Adam and Eve and how men and women became sinners. The story of the virgin birth of Jesus, how he died upon the cross of Calvary, defeated Satan. All of you know that story. But my question to you today is, have you made it personal? Is it real in your life? Do you know for sure that this Jesus that's introduced in Genesis 3.15 and that comes some 4,000 years later. Do you know this Jesus as your Lord and Savior in your life? Can I speak to all the mamas who are here for just a moment? Mama, you're a wonderful person. You're a great, great person. All that you've done, are doing, and will continue to do for children, grandchildren, even great-grandchildren. God bless you. But I would hate to think that there would be a single mother here who would walk out the door not knowing Christ as your Savior. Not knowing that He's the Lord of your life. In these moments, perhaps the Lord is speaking to you. I speak to you outwardly, but only the Lord can speak inwardly. And so I ask you, has the Lord spoken to you this morning? Has the Lord said, you know it's the truth. No matter how good a mother you are, no matter how good a person you are, you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And Jesus died upon the cross for sinners. And perhaps today He's calling you. Maybe today He's calling you. I don't know your heart. But is He calling you? Any men folk here today? He's calling you. He's letting you know that. Yep, you're a sinner. You're one of Adam and Eve's children. This sin nature they introduced to the world. You have it. And you know you have it. But Jesus says, I am the Savior. For the world. And I died for your sin. And if you'll claim that forgiveness, I'll wash you white as snow with my blood. I'll come into your heart and I'll make you a child of God. I'll do it today. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed and no one's looking around. Is there anyone here today that would say, I want to be saved today? 
I want to ask the Lord Jesus to come into my heart right now. In a moment, I'm going to pray, and I, I just would like to pray for you. You can pray right there where you are. But is there anybody that would slip your hand up and say, I, I want to ask the Lord to come into my heart today. I want to ask the Lord to save me today. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to try to drag you to the altar. I'm not going to make a spectacle out of you. I just want to pray for you. Is there anybody anywhere in the house? Just slip your hand up. Slip it right back down. I just want to pray for you. Anyone. God bless you. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm looking. Thank you. Back and forth, I'm looking. I don't want to leave you out. One last call. Lord Jesus, once again, we thank you for the day. We thank you for these mothers. Thank you, Lord, for the kind attention that the people have given me this morning. And I pray, dear Lord, that we've presented the facts. We presented the evidence. And now, Lord, we leave it in your hands. You've touched the hearts of some folks who've indicated, I, I, I want to trust Jesus today. Lord, I'm so grateful for that. And I know that every person here who said, Lord, I, I want you to save me today. I know, Lord, if they pray that prayer, I know that you will save them today because you promised you would. And I thank you for it. Come into their lives, Lord. Make them your children. Become the Lord of their life and begin to change them from the inside out. Lord, I don't know the hearts of every person here, but no, Lord, no matter what burden is on any heart today, I pray to your Lord that you would work with folks, with your spirit. Let us not just be a hearer of this word, but help us to be a doer. Now go with us as we go forth from this place, Lord. God, and direct us always in a way that pleases you. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Amen. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Now I've got some fellows that lined up to help us back there, ladies, to give you your flowers today. So I'm going to ask those guys if y'all just get up and go back there now. And... Uh, So these fellows will assist you, help you get the flowers out of the cartons that they're in and so forth and so on. I'm going on to the door to greet you. And um, I'm, please, please come out the front door, at least speak to me before you leave, because I want to shake everybody's hand today. We will have no service here tonight, no service tonight. Enjoy Mother's Day. Hopefully you'll have your mamas with you and you can do that. Um, Services on Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Let me get to the back door and then you'll be at liberty to go.